Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is Professor Oleander, and as you can see, we're playing around in Train Simulator 2015. On this somewhat historic day, it is May 30th, 2015, and for those of you that have been keeping up with Steam-related news, the Norfolk and Western 611 made its return trip home this morning at about 7.45. I think it arrived in Roanoke sometime around noon, 1 o'clock, that general, that general uh, time frame. Um, kind of a big day. Yesterday was its 65th birthday, and then it got to return home today. So it's going to be running until I think the last trip is scheduled for July 5th. But uh, but yeah, since that happened today, and since I have a couple of days off, I decided I was going to do something that I had promised to a certain individual, and that is make a video about the AT&N Consolidation, or as it's effectively known, the, the uh, Connie. So as I said, this is a 280, uh, which is a consolidation style locomotive. Uh, it is an older style, as you can see here by the huge gap that's in between the boiler and the frame, and that is there because uh, the firebox is so big when they used to run little uh, uh, six-wheelers, uh, or a uh, six-driver, if you will, the firebox was able to sit down lower because it would clear the the uh, the uh, drivers up here. This, you see the third axle stops right here, but once they added the fourth one, uh, they had to raise the firebox up to accommodate it because they couldn't, they couldn't make the firebox small enough to uh, squeeze down in between the frame. Um, which is something that got fixed later on. They were able to make taller drivers, and uh, they they found a workaround for it. But uh, but yeah, this engine is kind of uh, kind of sentimental for me. Uh, my hometown had a consolidation in it. What is this coming? E unit and the B unit. By the way, if you're ever curious about how to tell the difference between an E unit and a B unit, the difference is where the doors are. And actually, that might be an F. It is an F. I don't know. I haven't. I barely play this game, so I don't remember what all is in it. But I think that is an F unit. Yeah, that's an F unit. E units. If you'll stop. E units have this door right here. It's about mid mid locomotive and then the F units have the door back here at the end of the engine room. This is very similar to a locomotive that I have worked on. Although I don't like the uh, locomotives the way they're modeled in this game but uh, anyway and then of course the B units right there but yeah go back over here to this consolidation sorry. I, do, I wasn't expecting that I haven't played in this this uh, scenario. So, but yeah, I haven't I haven't messed around with this locomotive a whole lot. That's pretty typical, though. That plume of smoke coming out. Anyway, so yeah, this uh, this locomotive is sentimental. The 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 uh, hometown that I grew up in, which is a redundant statement, I know. It's it's late. Uh, my hometown had a consolidation in it. It was just a little bit bigger than this one. It had 50-inch uh, drivers. This one has 40. Um, when I first got into the cab of this thing, uh, it kind of made me homesick because uh, the locomotive that I used to work on, well, it's, it's smaller than this one, but ultimately they're, they're not that much different in size, to be honest. When I got up in the cab, a lot of the stuff is very similar, so it's almost like being in in my other my old engine again but uh, again this is made by the gentleman that created the FEF-3 the 844 not the actual locomotive the model pretty sure the designer of the 844 is passed on but uh, it's very nice uh, a lot of still a lot of attention to detail you see the the little wrinkles and the pits and everything in the side in the uh, side jacket just like you saw in the 844 makes it look it's not you know, smooth, and there actually are wrinkles in it. Um, 
I think, yeah, this is the lined one uh, with the white stripe on there. And got another one that's over here. Yeah, this is the regular one. You can see that there's no striping on the on the side of where the uh, footboards are. So come over here and look at this one again. This is the one we're going to be taking, by the way. But uh, yeah, a lot of stuff in here. You've got your brake valves up underneath here, which I believe this particular locomotive uses a 6ET. Um, I did not look in the manual. I have, I have looked in the manual. I kind of, I might have looked at a page or two in it, but uh, that uh, that is more than likely a 6ET with a uh, 6SA independent brake. Which again, that was the same style brake that the locomotive that I used to work on had. And you see up here in the place of the round piston style uh, valve, we have a D valve because it is shaped like a D on the inside of it, which is the same style valve that we had on the locomotive I used to work on. Uh, the only difference between this one and that one is, um, <coughs> excuse me, is the uh, the one I used to work on had Stevenson. This one has wall shirts, which is a pretty big improvement. It still uses a Johnson bar, and we'll talk about that when we get inside. We have our pilot up here, and no, this is not called a cow catcher. I have said that before. It will do a lot of things, but catching a cow is not one of them. This was mainly... Now, take this with a grain of salt, because this may not be 100% true, but... The main purpose behind these things was to clear telegraph poles. A lot of the books that I have, uh, books and stories that I've read over the years, talk about how telegraph poles were very brittle, either sabotage or people climbing on them, and they would break off and they'd fall across the track, and you'd have to stop for them and whatnot. And there's there's other reasons behind it. I'm sure that cattle may have been one of the one of the reasons why they put these on here, but it was mainly, as I understand it, for telegraph poles. The pole would fall off, you'd have this pilot up here, and you notice that it's fairly close to the rail. Most of them will just barely clear it. Uh, the modern standard is four inches, and I think most of these were probably around the same, but they were fairly close, and what you would do is you would just slow down a little bit, and then you would just push whatever it was off the track. Uh, if it was a telegraph pole, it would just kind of push over to one side. So that's that, and like I said, take that with a grain of salt because it may not be 100% correct. I don't really know if anybody knows why these things were put on there. They just, people started calling the things cow catchers. That's what everybody calls them. But, uh, but yeah, it's kind of nice to see an older style uh, pilot on the, on the front of one of these because most of the uh, newer locomotives, they kept getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and of course now they don't even use them. They call it a plow, because that's what it looks like. It looks like a big bulldozer plow. But, uh, yeah, we got our dynamo up here, which is running right now. It shouldn't be, because I haven't turned it on, but uh, anyway it is. And you see our classification lights on the sides. You know, all your... A, all of the nuts and stuff out here. Well, actually, these are bolts. And then your your dog ears for your smoke box and headlight lamp and so on and so forth. This is something that a lot of people will miss. That's actually the pivot pin for the front truck. A lot of people won't put that in there in uh, various models, so you just won't forget about it or they don't put a whole lot of detail into it. But again, this is the same guy that made the FEF3 that impressed me so much. And uh, this is fairly close to reality just from what I've been around consolidations and uh, this style, and you notice, you know, the truck's kind of sitting out here in nowhere. Which, if you want to get technical, if you really want to get technical, this particular locomotive, this is just an 040, or I'm sorry, not an 040, this is an 080 that's been adapted to put a front pilot truck on it. If you want to get technical about it, they had 080s, they were little, just little switchers. Um, but that's basically what this is. It's an 080 with a forward uh, a pony truck on it. And it's just, it's kind of clear once you see it like this. Uh, Vulcan made a, a 262, which was essentially the same thing. It was an 060 that had 
that they just added a pony truck to, a pony truck and a trailing truck to. And it's it's not as hard as it sounds. Um, it's actually fairly straightforward. But anytime you see one where the trucks are kind of hanging out there in the middle of nowhere, like this one is, uh, that's usually an indication that uh, they just took one of their older models and they adapted it. And that's what this was. This was an 080 that they just they made a truck to go on the front of it, and there should be some balance beams. Actually, you can see it right. Well, I don't know that's not how this frame. But back in there, there should be some equalizing bars, and they'll monkey around through here, uh, swing arms and all that sort of stuff, and they equalize out onto the drivers to put the weight on them. And he may have put them in here. There's your brake cylinders, by the way. Which, you know, that's something you don't even see from the outside. Well, I guess you do. You see the top of them, but uh, but they're there. That's where your brake cylinders are. Now he hasn't. It's not in there, but that's that's okay. And you see your spring hangers in here. They kind of balance back and forth. So yeah, again, he's put a lot of detail in this one. There's your driver boxes and your brasses, and then the sellers would be right down in here, which is where you'd put your journal oil. Um. Uh, looking around here, there's the front pivot for the front truck. Let's see, there. Oh, he did put it in there. That's what that is. Yep, he did put that in there. So, the front truck. And excuse me for taking so long to do this because it's just I don't remember if I did it with the 844 or not. But the front truck has got its own suspension up there, as you can see. And what it does is it raises and lowers. This, this bar and it can kind of go side to side but you see how this bar is hooked up to the spring hanger on the front driver so as this bar goes up and down it puts pressure on this spring and as the spring pivots on this rocker right here it makes this spring hanger go up and down and then that distributes the weight that the the pilot truck is carrying throughout the drivers. That's why all of them are kind of hooked together. They equalize out and they, they put more weight on the drivers. So kind of a cool thing. I'm glad he put that in there. I didn't expect any less from him, but I was kind of curious. But yeah, there's, I mean, it doesn't look like a whole lot, but there's, there's still quite a bit of detail in here. You know, the brake cylinders were kind of a shock to me, and I really haven't had a chance to look over this model, so I'll probably be finding stuff. And of course, our air tanks. And who is this coming up? GP9? Never run a GP9, I've run a GP7 before. So, going up here to the top, we've got a bell, a dingling, and there's forward sand dome. There's a rear sand dome. These don't share a common sand dome like uh, 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 newer locomotives do. Um, again, this is indicative of an older style. And then your sanding pipes that go down. This is a step. Okay, it just looked awful small, but that is a step. And then you got another step right there, and then there's a washout plug. Um, <clears throat> That is injector, so let's go down here. There's your check valve for your injector that goes into the boiler. And rivets and everything, so it's it's, it's nice. And he's got his builder plate on there, which is good to see. Who is this? Another GP9. It's a busy road. What's he stopping for? Oh, that's right, they did carry passengers with those locomotives. Uh, I don't know if, if many people know this, just a little fact for you. These GP9s, and the GP7s for that matter, had steam generators in the, in the short nose. Or short hood, however, we, however you want to call it. But they would have a uh, steam generator in here. And that's, they were actually built to do freight or passenger service. But yeah, they had a little steam generator in here so they could provide steam heat for the cars. So there's another little factoid for you. Now you notice some steam coming out of here. Uh, what that is, is you've got your little 
uh, relief valves or quote unquote drifting valves as we always call them and it's just a um, negative pressure type of thing this is mainly for when you're drifting down a hill with the throttle closed this allows some air to get into the to the valving so that you're not creating a vacuum on your dry pipe inside your boiler and all you have to do is just open the throttle a little bit and this thing will just suck itself shut uh, once it gets pressure on the other side of it it'll pop up and then it'll uh, close it off so it comes to sealed system you've got a lubricator line right here that goes up down the walkway down into the cabins of the hydrostatic lubricator and we'll talk about that in just a minute but uh, I think I've covered most everything out here on the outside a little uh, it's got a little single chime there and then there's your safety this locomotive only has one safety um, vent roofs windows Let's see what's all we got down here there's your sanding pipe coming down feed water going in, or uh, not feed water, but just water supply up to the injector on the fireman side. This pipe right here is the drain for the injector. And uh, again, this is one of those things that makes me nostalgic for my old engine. And uh, I'll talk about that in just a minute. This is something you don't see anymore, is uh, uh, friction style or plane bearings you would lift this lid up and you would fill the journal up with it this whole thing right here is called a journal box and it has an oil has a cotton pad in the bottom of it and the journal comes through and there's a brass on top with a fabric material uh, on it and uh, this is where the term hot boxes come from what would happen is these things have a seal in the back and they always leak um, as old car knockers used to tell me they never met one that didn't leak so you would fill them up just till they touched the bearing, or just till they touched the journal, because if you overfilled them, they would just leak out the back and make a bloody mess. But what would happen is these journals would run dry. Uh, at one time they tried putting grease in them, but I don't think that lasted very long. But they would put oil in them, and sometimes if they had a really bad leak, or they just somebody forgot to oil them. Uh, they would run dry, and as you can imagine, the cotton packing that's in there would start to heat up, and it would start to smolder, and over time it would get hotter and hotter and hotter, and it would actually seize up a bearing. And while we're talking about it, we'll go back here to the caboose. In addition to being the, the office for the conductor on the train, and uh, actually serving as a quarters for the brakeman. You see up here where the cupola is, this is where they would sit. There's, there's a chair facing either direction on both sides of it. So you've got one facing that way and you've got another one facing the other way. And as a, as a train would go into a curve, and we'll, we'll go, th I'll show you when we get into a curve. The train would go into a curve, the brakeman would go to one side or the other. And he would look down the length of the train. He's doing a visual inspection. And the engine crew would usually do the same thing. If they were going into a right-hand curve, the engineer would kind of look back and he'd make sure everything was all right. So you always had eyes on everything. And what they were looking for was smoke. If they got a lot of smoke, uh, it was usually a sign that they had a hot box. And there's a emergency valve back here. So this is back in the days before radio and whatnot. So if they found a problem, they'd just pull the cork on the train and uh, they'd stop. So another little thing for you. It's kind of cool to see because uh, all the cars have got friction bearings as well, or plane bearings, whatever you want to call them. So yeah, that's something that's interesting to see. I have oiled many of these things in my life. And... Uh, they're not fun. It's a pain in the ass. Uh, when a train would pull into the station, whether it was a passenger train or a freight train or whatever, when they came into a terminal, a, a crew would take over. And what, that's what they're... It was a, usually a three-man crew, and they would be expecting a train. They'd have a what's called a journal hook. They'd lift up all the lids on this. They would check the packing. They would check for scarring. They would top off all the journals and you know they'd have to run down the length of a train 
in the time that it took to stop, and then, you know, sometimes 30 minutes or whatever, just as quick as they can get it done, and they'd send the train back out. So, uh, there's a video on YouTube, it's Operation Fast Freight, or Norfolk and Western Fast Freight, if you ever get a chance to look at it sometime, it's, uh, it's actually kind of fascinating. And again, sorry, going off on tangents, I can't help it, you know. It's one of those things, I think somebody called it a teachable moment. Anytime you get a chance to teach somebody something, take it. Because the chance may never come up again. So, going back to our, our Connie here. Uh, again, nice model in our cross compounded air compressors here, which is uh, the locomotive I had. We didn't we didn't have a cross compound. We just had a, a, uh, a one cylinder, a one lunger, and uh, there's a drain on here too, and we'll see that in just a minute. But uh, I think that's everything back here. One of the things that's cool is he's animated the coal consumption, so as we go down the road, the coal will actually decrease, and then tail light, and all that good stuff. So let's hop in the cab with the selector, and get inside the cab here. Get some brakes on the train. There we go. And, um, so yeah, it's, it's a fairly detailed cab. I think this was his first locomotive, and he actually did a pretty good job on it. One of the things that impresses me is this, and we'll see it in just a second, but uh, let's go ahead and start turning some stuff on. So let's turn on the compressor, and we'll turn on the lubricator, throttle, or valve, whatever you want to call it. Then our injector valve, and then the blower valve, and then there's your blower control, as you can hear. This, I am not sure. I probably know what that is, and I just, it's not coming to me right now. I don't think there's a switch for something. It's on the. Hmm, that's interesting. I'm not going to waste too much time trying to figure out what the hell it is. And there goes the safety. Alright, so. I mentioned this lubricator, and I've got the, uh, the lubricator open. So I'm going to turn on the valve here, and then you see we've got the open and closed for, um, for that. What is that? It sounds like a Jeep. Yep. So I'm going to lift this up, and it's going to open it. And if we watch the little bullseyes here, a little drop of oil go up. Sometimes these are called weepers, sometimes they're called bullseyes, um, and they can be one or they can be four. Uh, we have one that is, we don't use it, but we have one that I think is three. It's been a while since seen it. It's an old style. It's got the oil reservoir, the brass oil reservoir up here. It's actually kind of nice. Uh, but they, these things, <laughs> these things are a pain. They'll hydrolock, they'll gum up, you know, they won't work. It's a pain in the ass. That's why they got away from these things and they used a uh, pressurized lubrication. What this does is it takes these little drops of oil. As you can see, they're coming through here. It takes very little drops of oil, and you can adjust the flow rate down here. And it puts it into steam as it's going through or water. And uh, what that does is that that steam goes into the, the various cylinders. You can see this left-hand valve, left-hand cylinder, right-hand valve, right-hand cylinder. And it sprays out into like a spider web. And it coats the inside of everything. And, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting that somebody was able to come up with this is a tallow based grease so it doesn't break down or oil it's almost a grease basically it's really really thick stuff and um, usually there'd be a hot shelf or something in here and you'd have a tallow pot on it and an oiler and that would be something you'd have to do periodically throughout the day is top off everything so there we've got our firebox doors that we put up there on the what do you, what do you call that? Butterfly doors. 
I thought it said something else. But, uh, yeah, the tilt pull down on it. We open it up, and there you see nice little heel at the back of the firebox door, which is pretty much what you would have. Down here on the floor, this is the foot pedal that you would actually use to open up that. This is uh, air actuated. There's your shakers over here and over here. Here's our damper. We're going to go ahead and open that up. That's on the bottom of the, uh, uh, underneath on the ash pan. Uh, the shakers, by the way, just to kind of explain them, periodically you have to clean your fire. You get a lot of ash built up uh, underneath your coal, underneath the bed of coal that you have in there, and you need to clean it so you can get air through the grates on the bottom. So what you would do is you come to a stop uh, over a pit or something, and you could, there's a handle, and I don't think he has it in here. Nah, I don't see it. But there's a big handle, and it goes down on these things and locks in, and you just sit there and you shake this one, and you shake that one, and you shake that one, and you shake that one. And uh, be very careful not to pull them all the way back, because if you pull them all the way back, it dumps the fire. So this one's probably got four set. I guess it is four sets. I don't think they would do them in twos on this one. But uh, yeah, it's kind of cool. Sander controls right here. And I can go ahead and turn them on, and we can go outside and we look. And there you see some sand coming down on the track. So we're gonna turn that off. Make sure it's off. I want to use all my sand. Oh, come on. There we go. I just want to make sure it's hands off. Alright, it's off. So again, there's some washout plugs and some flexible stays and various things. Big throttle right here. Um, what else? Oh yeah, that's just the leakage port. It's actually kind of cool how they had to do these. These smaller engines had linkages all over the place. Uh, water column is right here. We'll turn on the dynamo in just a second. Uh, I wish I could get over to the fireman's seat, but uh, that's all right. Can't see what that is, but yeah, the the doors on here open, and there is a purpose as to why they are there. It's not necessarily for ventilation. We can open up the open up the windows here and open up the door. So the purpose of these guys is, you see, you've got a perfect access down into the walkway. And what you would do, this is back in the old days, what you would do is you would, sometimes you would do it when you were running, you would walk down here while you were running, and there was usually like a lubricator access uh, somewhere down in here, and while you were running, you would take your tallow pot and you would top off your lubricator. There would be a little cup or something down in here, and you would top it off. Uh, it's just running back and forth. But uh, you would do it when you were running. There's a lot of stories of Casey Jones doing that. Um, another book that I have, uh, I think it was a passenger train. Uh, one of the guys that was firing, he wrote a book about his, his life on the railroad, and he talked about having to go out. He actually talked about doing it right before they got into the station. He would walk out there. He was only 16 years old, and he just kind of wanted to show people that, you know, he had made it. Which is, you know, he had a lot of pride in what he did. And, um, <clears throat> so yeah, they would walk out there, and that's just so that they can also service some stuff too. So, uh, really, they did away with these. This was probably one of the last locomotives to actually have this. I take it back. We've got one that was built in 27 that had that. So, um, yeah, these went away usually in the 30s. The windows kept getting smaller and smaller and smaller. If you look at the one on, like, the J and the uh, and the A, the window is not even a third of the size of this thing. So, so yeah. Up here, you've got the, we always call these firing windows. And the idea behind them is you sit back here you can see your fire, and as you, you can see with the smoke coming out of the stack, and as you can see, 
they're not really effective. And it's not just, it's not, it's not the modeler's fault, it's just that's the way it was. Now the fireman's got a fairly, fairly decent view. But you can actually see the smokestack right there, but that's what these are for. These are called firing windows. Uh, the British ones use brown and uh, I thought for a second this had a slide on it. So I was kind of looking at it and I guess it does. That's a, I've never seen one that had that on there before. But anyway, whistle core comes across. And that is that. Okay, that's just a, that's an electrical box for the dynamo. I'm sitting there trying to figure out what the hell that was. So, yeah, let's see. Injector is right here. The way this joker works, I open up the water valve. And this is part of a daily inspection, by the way. You would open your water valve up. We step down here. Not there. We step down over here. You see water running down inside the cab. And if I close that and open this, oops, if I open it. Alright, open, don't I? You see just steam spraying out. Now these these in real life, these type of injectors, these are non-lifting. Well they're kind of sort of lifting. <coughs> these things are a pain in the ass to prime. Especially once your water starts getting low in your tank. You'll have to sit there and you'll you pull them back just a little bit and you have to sit there and wait for them to prime and then you pull them all the way back and that's why uh, newer injectors actually have a priming position. You pull them back to the first notch, and then you pull them all the way back once you, once you heard it pick up. So we'll go ahead and we'll run a little bit into it. We can't run much. Again, it sounds like a toilet bowl running, or a toilet bowl flushing. So we'll close that, and hop over here. So the gauges we've got, this is boiler pressure here, this is steam chest pressure, this is the main reservoir and the equalizing reservoir, this is the brake pipe and the um, independent brake. And I'm going to go ahead and set my independent all the way on, put it in the lap, and I have to put this into release. This brakes have bled all the way down. Now, to me, the brake pipe is a little slow to respond, but again, uh, these valves are a little bit slower. Sixes are known for being slow. So, uh, let's see what else we got down here. We got steam, so what did I say? Uh, Main reservoir and equalizer reservoir, brake pipe and brake cylinder, and then up here, this used to be the uh, a second independent brake, but um, Mike had told me that he was going to uh, turn this into a back pressure gauge, so this is a back pressure gauge similar to what the 844 has on it, uh, which is which is fine. Some locomotives had them. You you would mainly see them more on. There's a. I was going to say there's a train coming. You would see these more on faster passenger engines as a way of running efficiency, but it's fine having it on here. Again, these locomotives are not made for uh, not made for speed. These are made to do work in the yard because of the small drivers. Bigger driver engines are made for speed. Speed. Uh, smaller driver engines are made for work. Uh, slow work, actually. So you get a bell valve here. We go outside, you see the bell swinging, that's actually cool, kind of cool. Beside that we have the reverser, which is also known as the Johnson Bar. These things are unforgiving. That's putting it mildly. It's not so bad with wall shirts, it's a pain with Stevenson. Um, with wall shirts, this won't move a whole lot. But with Stevenson, this, th this joker will try everything it can to 
come out of a notch. And anytime you go to hook up with it, you have to brace yourself. You have to grab it with two hands, put your shoulder into it, and just kind of, you have to fight it. Because it's, it'll just sit there and just rock back and forth, back and forth, while you're going down the railroad. Uh, they actually outlawed these things in the 40s because they, are, they had so many guys that were getting broken shoulders and, and uh, just getting injured with them because they care of pain. Uh, reverser. This is a rod type. This is an air actuated. It's actually a rod that goes down to the cylinder cocks on the uh, on the cylinders. So we'll just go ahead and open them up. They're actually, they actually should be open because we're sitting out of sand still. But that's one thing I didn't look at while we were down here was the cylinder cocks, which are all right. I guess. It... We're rolling. Well, we'll set 10 pounds. Should be enough to hold it. Maybe, kind of, sort of. Let's just see. Oh my god, he did. He did. Now that's cool. So there you see it's rocking back and forth. That's why I said this is a. Uh, this is rod activated, so I'm kind of curious to see if the actual lead. See, that should go up right there. Yep, he did. I'll be damned. I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm, I'm awestruck right now because I've never, I've never seen somebody that has gone to the links that he has, but yeah, that's that's how it works, is you've got a little rocker in there, and you, you're pulling that bar back and forth. I had no idea he had modeled it on this engine, so that's kind of cool to see. But you can see how they work, all it is is good creep. No reason why we should be sliding right now, but uh, you can see how it works. Is you push it forward, it lifts this. There's a little valve in there, and it pushes it up into the cylinder, and that allows steam to escape. So right now these are open, and then you pull it back, and it sets down, and the valve pops down, and it closes up. Now these things can weep from time to time. This style is uh, not very reliable. They can hang open and uh, do funky stuff, but uh, I'm just, I'm I'm in shock right now because I, I was not expecting that, and there you go, so um, let's go ahead and open up the generator here, you might be able to hear it spooling up, that's something else that he added in there as well, about the uh, the generator's full the uh, dynamo spooling up. So turn off our turn off our cab light here. We'll turn on our accessory light. And tail light switch, headlight switch. Turn the headlight on. Here you see, and we'll check out our classification lights. We've got white, red, green. Uh, we're not gonna use them. Uh, we'll use we use the white ones. We can get a, we can get by with white ones. Green ones we can't, red ones we can't, we can get by with white ones. So I think that's everything. I think I've rambled on quite enough to get this mother rolling. Let me first there's a lot of traffic out there on the railroad right now, so let me check and see. We're not gonna hit anybody. Also check. I don't think we have a timetable, so we're good to go. This is another thing he added. You you used to be able to just have to use the window here. He's actually added the uh, outside. Uh, a what am I trying to say? The view outside of the cab window here, which is just like on the 844, which I was so glad to see. So um, first things first, we will put our reverser into forward. So the cocks are open. 
got some water. I'm going to put a little bit of water in here just in case. Make sure to that open. On some railroads, the engineer was responsible for carrying his own water, and the fireman was just a fireman. There you see the safety is finally decided to see. Alright, that's enough. So yeah, to open these things, you would open the water valve first, and then you would pull your, your steam valve, and then you would close the steam valve first, and then you would do that. And yeah, that's that's kind of nostalgic, because I'm this is the type of uh, injector I'm used to using, so. <sighs> Makes me homesick. Alright, let's get rolling. The whistles, it's okay. Could be louder. But it'll get us by. We'll ring the bell for a minute. We'll open our throttulation. I did open those right. There we go. That's what I was looking for. I saw the relief valves were still open. them to dry out the cylinders really well. Put that into rear release and then we'll knock off our independent. And slip, 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 slip. Come on. Now, if you're listening to the exhaust chuffs, I think that's probably one of the biggest, I don't want to say issue, but I think it's. I know that he just he had, he changed them. Uh, I think it's too bassy right now. Let's see how fast I can go. Oh God, we're clear for sixty. Start shoveling. I th I think it's just a little bit on the bassy side. Um, this is a. A saturated engine. It's only running at 100. And this thing only runs about 195 psi. So it's a. It's just a saturation engine. It's not superheated, so the, the exhaust is not going to be terribly loud. See the. I kind of like how this behaves. A um, little flicker back and forth, which is pretty much the way they should work. But all in all, this isn't a very bad locomotive. I kind of like it. Um, just a few things. I think the exhaust is, like I said, the exhaust is just too bassy for this for this engine. It's not a very big locomotive. Um, my volume up so way I can hear it. But yeah, I think it's I think it's just a little bit too much on the bassy side. You can't really hear your chuffs, all you can hear is just this really, really loud roar. But uh, as far as I can tell we're clear. So I'm gonna see how fast I can get this thing to go. if I don't have to throw my fireman outside of the cab. Let's check this. Okay, we are gaining on it. 
this is another cool little thing to see the butterfly doors open and close as uh, as each back of their shoveling. Another thing is the drain on the air compressor. Open up here. You can see that's to let water come out of the pipes that way it doesn't uh, uh, doesn't lock up. Just close that off. Oh good, he caught up. One of the things about these engines is they will drink water a little bit quicker than other engines because the boiler is such smaller. And you can see we're using water at a pretty good clip, so you'll have to periodically put water back in it. And uh, I don't remember if I've set it in on, uh, set it or not, but about 30, 30, 40 mile an hour is about as fast as you want to take these things because these small drivers' engines aren't, uh, these small driver engines are not made for a whole lot of speed. Just open it on up. Good looking smoke, nice and gray, not too terribly black. But uh, let's go back here to the caboose, and this is what I was talking about. He would look down the side of the train right here, and he'd be looking for hot boxes. So, and again, the conductor, he could, the uh, engineer or the fireman, he could look back as well. We're losing speed. While we're popping off, we'll increase that. The water pressure is probably going to drop quite a bit. Keep shoveling, don't stop. Let's see if we can. Oh, well, yeah, you can't see it, but. Uh, in the firing window, you can just barely see the smoke right there. Looks like I can see it really good right here. Really, right now I'm just looking at my cutoff, or not cutoff, but I'm looking at my back pressure gauge. I'm trying to stay between about 10 and 15. Engine this size, that's about right. Should be getting a, I was going to say, should be getting an approach here shortly. We're not going to get over 45, I can, I can tell you that right now. That looks like an approach to me. Yep. Yeah, I could I could definitely do it with a different whistle, but it's it's okay. Oh, one thing. He did add what you can quill this one just like you can the 844s, which kind of nice. I wish more guys would do that because it, 
It is kind of nice to play with the whistle. Alright, I figured you'd be ready to kill off all in one. Yeah, these... This way is a medium. Straight up and down is a clear, medium, and then straight across is a stop. So I kind of figured we were getting ready to come up on one. We're really starting to pick up speed now. carry over. go down great on this thing, I probably should start grabbing about five pounds worth of brakes and tell my fireman to quit shoveling all together. Go ahead and grab us a break. Just grab about ten pounds and bail off my independence. Close the throttle. speed at a pretty good clip just to keep it going. I'm going to put the reverser back into full forward, which you would do if you're drifting, and you know the drifting valves are open. And we're just going to give it a little bit of steam. I'm not giving it much. I'm trying not to give it much anyway. I'm just going to give it just enough to kind of keep some, keep some steam in the chest. Just a little bit of a little bit of pressure on it to keep keep the momentum up because as we start coming down the hill um, the speed's going to keep picking up so I don't want to get faster than about 25 or so but once we get down to the bottom of the hill we'll open it up which if I remember right we'll be going downhill here I think this, this might turn back up I don't know it's been a while since I've been over this. There you can see we're picking up speed at a pretty good place, so I just close the throttle. It'll slow down a little bit. They call this kind of stretch braking. Um, most railroads want, want you to have control, and there you can see 10 pounds is not going to hold it back, so we're going to have to go to 15. We'll put about 12 pounds on it. I'd have to go more than that. Let's go to 15. I think 15 is going to hold it. Give it a second. Not going to hold. Let's go 18. 18 stopped. Just for reference, a full service application is considered 20 pounds or more. And it's going to take a full service. So, full service. And that's slowing it down. Good rule of thumb on these brakes is use no more than you need. So take it a couple pounds at a time until you can see that your speed is arresting. And uh, one thing to consider is, uh, as far as water is concerned, you see how where the, the bob is right there. Uh, do not put water in it because we're facing downhill, which means all the water is pitch towards the nose. And if you fill this thing up, if you get the water too high right here, uh, when you turn uphill, you'll pose a bigger risk of 
doing what's called carrying over, which is you're taking water and running it through the cylinders, and you can uh, hydro lock your cylinders and actually blow the head off of them. Open the bottle just a bit. QP9. Start knocking the brake off here in a minute. Now an old school trick for the brakes. Now I've got two for for this particular grade. I've got too much brake because yeah, you see it's it's come down to a 1.8. Uh, we were going down to three percent. What we can do is we can let the speed slow down a little bit. And we come up here, and this is this is one of those things where you got to be quick. If you knock your brake off. It's going to take it a minute to equalize back out. You knock your brake off, you let your speed come up, and then you start grabbing brake again. Now you got to make sure you've got throttle because that keeps everything stretched out on you. We may not need to come back on the brake again, but I think we are. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to pull five more pounds. Close throttle. And what that does is that grabs the train so that way that the slack doesn't run in and out on me. And we'll just do like we did before. We'll set up about two or three more pounds, bail off. But slowing it not fast enough, we'll go to 10. Probably going to take about 12. There's 12. Let's go to 15. Fifteen's gonna hold it. You have to be really careful about doing that though, because if you if you don't give the brakes enough time to charge back up, because they'll only charge and release, uh, you can actually run out of air on the train. That's what's called pissing your air away. So if you do a lot of applications and releases um, without giving the time for the reservoirs on the cars to fully charged back up you can you can make an application and there's not enough air in the in the reservoirs to complete the application so it's just one thing to be careful of and uh, this locomotive does model that and it models it fairly well there is no uh, no worse of a feeling than to pull a brake application and not feel the brakes come on I have been there before. Uh, it, it's only happened to me once, and it happened because of something we had to stop, and I ended up having to pull more brakes than I wanted to to get stopped. It was one of those rush situations that were going downhill, and uh, the brakes didn't have time to charge back up, so and it, I ended up taking full service just to get the train to grab. Uh, luckily, we were close to the bottom of the hill and uh, getting ready to start turning back up but it was it was scary there's there's no worse of a feeling than to have a to be on a freight train or to be on a train in general and you start pulling brake and brakes ain't there but yeah i don't want to i don't want to pull any more brake than i've got 15 is more than plenty Then you see that's our uh, that's our steam chest pressure. It's just barely got three three percent of the boiler pressure in it. It's, it's steadily starting to rise. As it rises, we'll pick up a little bit of speed. I'm not too terribly worried about it, but it's all downhill from here. So we'll kind of go look at the beautiful scenery. I do kind of like this route. I've taken the 844 over it up the uh, through the curve. And like I said, the, like I said in that particular video, the horseshoe curve is not the the worst part of the route. The worst part of the route is what we're on right now. These curves and uphills and downhills and these heavy grades. So, 29 mile an hour. We'll close the throttle. And we're just drifting.
One thing that you might want to, that, uh, Mike, I know you're probably watching this. Uh, one thing, maybe a little bit of rod knock on this one, uh, kind of like what the 844's got. Uh, especially on these, because I couldn't tell you now because I can't see it, but I think pretty sure this that's not a roller. Could be wrong. But uh but yeah these I think these style of rods are notorious for knocking. It's just too quiet. I'm not used to, we have a saying if a steam locomotive is quiet there's a problem. Yeah, I kind of like this locomotive. Uh, it's a good little runner. Like I said, you're not going to break any speed records with this thing, but uh, she does the job. Yeah, well, just a little bit. We just enough to keep the pressure up. I don't want to get too far down below 190. Just peek at it for a second. Oh yeah, we don't. We it's not going to take much. Just a little spread here and there. That would be, I, I was thinking about it earlier, it would be kind of cool if, uh, if somebody could design something where there was a button you pushed, not the R button where it's kind of working like a stoker, but where you could actually be the fireman, and you, you press that button and that's a scoop full or whatever, and uh, you know every time you needed to put coal in it, you'd, you'd have to press that button. Which is kind of closer to reality the way it is. It's fine now, but uh, I'm just thinking out loud. I think it would be cool to see something like that. Let's give it a little bit of throttle. One of these days, I got to get up here to the. Uh, to the curb and see it. I've, I've yet to make it up into that portion of Pennsylvania. Go up and see the Juanita shops up in Altoona and just kind of look at the yard. Always said if I retired I wanted to go to Pennsylvania. It's just beautiful up here. Been up around Gettysburg and um, uh, near the Maryland border. It's really nice. It's just like this, a lot of mountains, a lot of green, a lot of pastures. I was actually, uh, the first time I ever went up there, I'd, I'd never seen something. I'd never seen a place like that before in my life. So it was really kind of a change of view from where I was from. Which honestly, where I was from wasn't too terribly difficult from this, uh, different from this. Not as many mountains. But yeah, these little these little two eight O's are these were workhorses. These were the most popular locomotives ever built uh, for this very reason. You know, they're very versatile. They can they were the equivalent of road switchers today. Uh, back then, you could you could use them in the yard just switching, or you could actually take them out. Now the the speeds have changed. The speeds on the road have have gone up, and these locomotives couldn't keep up with it which is one of the reasons why you didn't see a whole lot of them out there towards the end. Uh, but the the big 484s, like I said, and the, the Northerns, uh, the Northerns and the Makados, you saw a lot of those. The Makados were the 282s, which were in their own right. They weren't, they were never as popular as the 280s, but they were still fairly popular locomotives. Ready to go up to 35, so I can we'll just open the throttle because this it's all downhill until we get past the. It's actually all downhill until we get back into the yard, so not a whole lot we can do. I probably should have taken the other one because the other one would have been going uphill. Nice bit of flange squeal. Like God invented rail greasers.
one thing I'm going to do while we're in this curve is I'm going to go into a release. But hopefully I won't break the speed limit before we get through there. Ah, oh, we'll be fine. Let them charge for a minute. Oop, wrong one, wrong one. That's one of the reasons I don't like those those being together like that. Alright, give some throttle. Now get that break in, not the other one. Should have grabbed it with the mouse. All right, we can close the throttle now. <laughs> yeah, I went to uh, I went to apply the automatic brake and ended up applying the independent brake, so we probably slid there for a minute. to say whether I've actually done that in real life or not. I'll let you guess. I will say this, the odds are favorable in the affirmative. But I'm not going to say whether it really happened. That's a funny feeling. I didn't catch it quite in time. That's one of the reasons why I, I try and give myself a couple miles an hour with the variance because you can catch it if you're accelerating. If you're actually, if I was actually on that engine without looking at the speedometer, you could feel it. Um, there's a point that you can find, and it's it's one of those things that you you kind of refine with over time. Is that you you can feel the acceleration. You can feel whenever you've got a hold on it, and you've got Nero. Uh, uh, near, near zero is what I was trying to say, not Nero, but near zero acceleration. So it's kind of like you're just sitting there. And then you can feel whenever the train starts to speed up or when the train starts to slow down. That's why engineers will, uh, they can sometimes tell you that they can run a train blindfolded, especially if it's over a, a route that they have run for years and years and years. And I can, I can believe it because, um, for me, I've run over the same route so much now that um, I mean, I've got almost 500 hours on it now, and I very rarely look at my instruments. Like I know, I know where on the uh, brake handle I need to pull it to go to 10 pounds. Where <clears throat> I kind of know where I need to pull brake, where I don't need to pull brake, where I need to uh, knock them off and let it pick up some speed and then, you know, come back and catch them again, like I did on the hill up there. Um, that's something that I would do in real life is just kind of let it go into release for a minute, you know, let it go into release for a little bit, and then you would come back and you'd pull it into first service and then you'd start, you'd reset, you'd go up again a couple pounds at a time. And again, I'm just making small talk because there's not a whole lot to say. Um, I don't remember if I pointed this out, but there's our whistle, whistle cord, which is again stuck. You pull it down, you push it up, down up. Um, let's see what else. Holy crap! How did I let the steam pressure get down? What are you doing over there? Ah, we still got a half a glass. We're fine. 
That's called conserving coal. 125 pounds on the boiler. That's so we can put it to bed tonight when we get in. Actually. So while we're talking about it, since I have foolishly... Well, since my fireman over there just... I don't know what he's doing. I don't even think he knows what he's doing. So here is the infamous horse shoe curve. I don't know why I'm even talking about it. Where are we at? Getting ready to go into the yard. Alright, great. So, while I'm thinking about it, when you fire one of these locomotives, uh, you you'd build up what's called a heel back here at the door sheet. And you could kind of spread the coal out throughout the box. You'd fill your thin spots and, and whatnot. Look for holes. And um, so on and so forth. What's the grade look like? Yeah, I can give it a little bit more. But you could kind of... you would spray a little bit over here, you kind of go through the corners, and you spread a little bit in the middle, and then uh, you would shovel the cor the back corners. Um, and the reason why you would build a heel up back here is because as the locomotive is working, the coal will shake forward. So you build it up high at the back, and then it shakes forward towards the front as you're, as you're running. It makes it easier on you. So again, just kind of one of those things. I could knock off the brake, but I kind of like making my fireman work for it. I'll knock off the brake. What do I pay him for? Sorry for being quiet, it just kind of... I let it get behind. Still can't believe I did that. That's what happens when you're talking when you're running a steam locomotive. You forget what the hell you're doing. So where do I want to park this mug? Where is it going to park? One thing I forgot to mention is there is a blowhard right here. Put that a little bit. 
that'll help him some. It's gonna be ready to put to bed by the time we get there. Let's put a couple more pounds for the brake on. So aside from the fact that if I were firing this engine in real life, the engineer would have already shot me. Not a bad trip. Now see, this is what pisses me off about this game. It drops to 15 for no damn reason, then it says 30 right there, and now it's going down to 15, and we'll just put it into a full service. I'll slow everything down. like 14.9 to me. You can sleep when you're dead. God, it's almost 50% full. Not sure why the I don't know why it dropped down so much. Well, we'll just bring her to a stop here. Let all the passengers see the the famous, the world famous. Consolidation designed by Smokebox. There we go. No, don't go into a release. That's interesting. Anyway. So yeah, that is the the Connie. As our pressure is very, very slowly coming back up. Maybe not quite as, as responsive as it should be. Um... Again, a lot of that depends on the, the grade of coal that you're using. But uh, I'm not going to complain. I'm, you know, it's one of those things. I can't. I really couldn't tell you how much coal we've used. We haven't used a whole lot because we're coming down mo downhill most of the way. But uh, that's the uh, that's the ATN Connie. Nice little locomotive. I like it a lot. Uh, the whistle could stand to be louder, and uh, you could probably take a lot of the bass out of the exhaust out of the exhaust but other than that this is a fun little engine I'm probably gonna run it a lot more and uh, gonna be doing some more some more videos on uh, train sim and, and things like that so uh, with that being said if you haven't got this locomotive check it out on the workshop and get it it's worth the price of admission so that being said good night everybody if you get a chance go see the 611 and uh, I will see you next time.